15. After many telephone calls, much pleading on behalf of the defendant, and a long forgiving letter from his mother, it was decided that Dill could stay. We had a week of peace together. After that, little, it uh, seemed a nightmare was upon us. It began one evening after supper. Dill was over. Aunt Alexander was in her chair in the corner. Atticus was in his. Jim and I were on the floor reading. It had been a placid week. I had uh, minded Auntie. Jim had uh, outgrown the treehouse, but helped Dill he and me construct a new rope ladder for it. Dill had uh, hit upon a foolproof plan to make Boo Radley come out at no cost to ourselves. Place a trail of lemon drops from the back door to the front yard, and he'd follow it like an ant. There was a knock on the front door. Jim answered it and said it was uh, Mr. Heck Tate. We'll ask him to come in, said Atticus. I already did. There's some men outside in the yard. They want you to come out. In Maycomb, grown men stood outside in the front yard for only two reasons. Death and politics. I wondered who had died. Jim and I went to the front door, but Atticus called, go back in the house. Jim turned out the living room lights and pressed his nose to a window screen. Out Aunt Alexandra protested. Just for a second, Auntie, let's see who it is, he said. Dill and I took another window. A crowd of men was standing around Atticus. They all seemed to be talking at the same time. Moving him to the county jail tomorrow, Mr. Tate was saying. I don't look for any trouble, but I can't guarantee there won't be any. Don't be foolish, heck, Atticus said. This is Maycomb. And I was just uneasy. Heck, we've gotten one postponement of this case just to make sure there's nothing to be uneasy about. This is Saturday, Atticus said. Trial will probably be Monday. You can uh, keep him. One more night. Can't you? I don't think anybody in Maycomb begrudged me a client with with uh, times this hard. There was a murmur of glee that died suddenly when Mr. Link D said, Nobody around here is up to anything. It's that old serum bunch I'm worried about. Can't you get a... Uh, what is it, heck? Change of venue, said Mr. Tate. Not much point in that now, is it? Atticus said something inaudible. I uh, turned to Jim, who waved me to silence. Besides, Atticus was saying, you're not scared of that crowd, are you? Know how they do when they get shinnied up. They don't usually drink on Sunday. They uh, go to church most of the day, Atticus said. This is a special occasion, though, someone said. They murmured and buzzed until Auntie said if Jim didn't turn on the living room lights, he would disgrace the family. Jim... Didn't hear her. Don't you see why you touched it in the first place? Mr. Link, Dees, was saying, you got everything to lose from this, Atticus. I mean, everything. You really think so? This was Atticus's dangerous question. Do you really think you want to move there, Scout? Bam, 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 and the checkerboard was swept clean of my room. Do you really think that, son... Then read this. Jim would struggle the rest of the evening through the speeches of uh, Henry W. Grady. Link, that boy might go to the chair, but he's not going till the truth's told. Atticus's voice was even. And you know what the truth is. There was a murmur among the group of men, made more ominous when Atticus moved back to the bottom front step and the men drew nearer toward him. Suddenly Jim screamed, Atticus, the phone's ringing. The men jumped a little and scattered. They were people we saw every day. Merchants, in-town farmers. Uh, Dr. Reynolds was there. So was um, Mr. Avery. We'll answer it, son, called Atticus. Laughter broke them up. When Atticus switched on the overhead light in the living room, he found Jim at the window, pale, except for the vivid mark of the screen on his nose. <laughs> Why on earth are you sitting in the dark, he asked. Jim watched him go to his chair and pick up the evening paper. I sometimes think Atticus subjected every crisis of his life to tranquil, tranquil evaluation behind uh, 
the Mobile Register, or the Birmingham News, and the Montgomery Advertiser. They were after you, weren't they? Jim went to him. They wanted to get you, didn't they? Atticus lowered the paper and gazed at Jim. What have you been reading? He asked, and he said gently, No, son. Those were our friends. It wasn't a, um, <clears throat> a gang. Jim was looking from the corners of his eyes. Atticus tried to stifle a smile, but didn't make it. No, we don't have mobs and that nonsense uh, in Maycomb. I've never heard of a gang in Maycomb. The Ku Klux got some, uh, you know, after some Catholics one time. Never heard of any Catholics in Maycomb either, said Atticus. You're confusing that with something else. Way back about, uh, I'd say, 1920, there was a Klan, but it was a political organization more than anything. Besides, they couldn't find anyone to scare. They uh, paraded by Mr. Sam Levy's house one night, but Sam just stood on his porch and told them things had come to a, a pretty pass. He, he, you know, he had sold them the very sheets on their backs. Sam made them so ashamed of themselves, they went away. The Levy family met all criteria for being fine folks. They did the best they could with the sense that they had, but, uh, well, and uh, they had been living on the same plot of ground in Maycomb for five generations. The Ku Klux is gone, said Atticus. It'll never come back. I walked home with Dill and returned in time to overhear Atticus saying to Auntie, in favor of the Southern womanhood as much as anybody, uh, but not for preserving polite fiction at the expense of human life, a pronouncement that made me suspect they had been fussing again. I sought Jim and found him in his room, on the bed, deep in thought. Have they been at it? I asked. Sort of. She won't let him alone about Tom Robinson. She almost said, Atticus is disgraced in the family. Scout, I'm scared. Scared of what? Scared about Atticus. Somebody uh, might, might hurt him. Jim preferred to remain mysterious. All he would say to my questions was, go on and leave him alone. Next day was Sunday. In the interval between Sunday school and church, when the congregation stretched its legs, I saw Atticus standing in the yard with another knot of men. Mr. Heck Tate was present, and I wondered if he had seen the light. He never went to church. Even Mr. Underwood was there. Mr. Underwood had no use for any organization but the Maycomb Tribune, of which he was the sole owner, editor, and printer. His days were spent at his linotype, where he refreshed himself occasionally from an ever-present gallon jug of cherry wine. He rarely gathered news. People brought it to him. It was said that uh, he made up every edition of the Maycomb Tribune out of his own head and wrote it down on the uh, linotype. This was believable. Something must have been up to haul Mr. Underwood out. I caught Atticus coming in the door, and he said that they'd moved Tom Robinson to the Maycomb Jail. He also said, more to himself than to me, that if they'd kept him there in the first place, there wouldn't have been any fuss. I watched him take his seat on the third row from the front, and I heard him uh, rumble, Nearer my God to thee! Some notes behind the rest of us. He never sat with Auntie Jim and me. He liked to be by himself in church. The fake peace that prevailed on Sundays was made more irritating by Aunt Alexandra's presence. Atticus would flee to his office directly after dinner, where if we sometimes looked in on him, we would find him sitting back on a swivel chair, reading, and Alexandra composed herself for a two-hour nap and dared us to make any noise in the yard. The neighborhood was resting. Jim and his old age had taken to his room with a stack of football magazines. So Dill and I spent our Sundays creeping around in deer's pasture. Shooting on Sundays was prohibited. So Dill and I kicked Jim's football around the pasture for a while, which was no fun. Dill asked if I'd like to have a poke at Boo Radley. I said I didn't think it'd be nice to bother him and spent the rest of the afternoon filling Dill in on last winter's events. He was considerably impressed. We parted at supper time. And after our meal, Jim and I were sitting down to the routine evening when Atticus did something that interested us. 
He came into the living room carrying a long electrical extension cord, and there was a light bulb on the end. I'm going out for a while, he said. You folks will um, be in bed when I come back, so I'll say goodnight right now. With that, he put his hat on and went out the back door. He's taking the car, said Jim. Our father had a few peculiarities. One was he never ate desserts. Another was that he liked to walk. As far back as I could remember, there was always a Chevrolet in excellent condition in the car house, and Atticus put many miles on it in business trips, but in Maycomb, he walked to and from his office four times a day, covered about, well, two miles. He said his only exercise was walking. In Maycomb, if one went for a walk with no definite purpose in mind, it was correct to believe one's mind incapable of definite purpose. Later on, I bade my aunt and brother good night and was well into a book when I heard Jim rattling around in his room. His um, go-to-bed noises were so familiar to me that I knocked on the door. Why aren't you going to bed? I'm going downtown for a while. He was changing his pants. Why, it's almost 10 o'clock, Jim. He knew it, but he was going anyway. Uh, then I'm going with you. If you say, no, you're not, I'm going anyway. Here? Jim saw that he would have to fight me to keep me home, and I suppose he thought a fight would antagonize Auntie, so he gave in with a little grace. I dressed quickly. We waited until Auntie's light went out, and we walked quietly down the back steps. There was no moon tonight. Dill want to come, I whispered. So we will, said Jim gloomily. We leaped over the driveway wall, cut through Miss Rachel's side yard, and went to Dill's window. Jim whistled Bob White. My whistler's dead. Dill's face appeared at the screen, disappeared, and five minutes later he unhooked the screen and crawled out. An old campaigner. He did not speak until we were on the sidewalk. What's up? Jim's up the look-arounds, an affliction Calpurnia said, all boys caught at his age. Just got this feeling, Jim said, just uh, just this feeling. We went by Mrs. DuBose's house, standing empty and shuddered. Her camellias grown up in weeds and Johnson grass. There were eight more houses to the post office corner. The south side of the square was deserted. Uh, giant monkey puzzle bushes <laughs> bristled each corner, and between them an iron hitching rail glistened under the streetlights. A, a light shone in the uh, county toilet. Otherwise, that side of the courthouse was dark. A larger square of stores surrounded the courthouse square. Dim lights burned from deep within them. Atticus's office was in the courthouse when he began his law practice, but after several years of it, he moved to quieter quarters in the Maycomb Bank building. When we rounded the corner of the square, we saw the parked car in front of the bank. He's in there, said Jim, but he wasn't. His office was reached by a long hallway. Looking down the hall, we should have seen an Atticus Finch attorney at law in small sober letters against the light from behind his door. It was dark. Jim peered in the bank door to make sure. He turned the knob. The door was locked. Let's go up the street. Maybe he's visited Mr. Underwood. Mr. Underwood not only ran the Makeup Tribune office, he lived in it. That is, above it. He covered the courthouse and jailhouse news simply by just looking out his upstairs window at him. The office building was on the northwest counter, corner of the square, and to reach it, we had to pass the jail. The Maycomb Jail was the most venerable and hideous of the county's buildings. Atticus said it was something like uh, Cousin Joshua St. Clair might have designed. It was certainly someone's dream, starkly out of the place in a town of square-faced stores and deep-roofed houses. The Maycomb Jail was a miniature gothic joke, one cell wide and two cells high, complete with tiny battlements and flying buttresses. Its fantasy was heightened by its red brick facade and the thick steel bars at its ecclesiastical. Oh my lord, here's a word. 
ecclesiastical windows. We just don't say some of these words anymore. Ecclesiastical. That's it. Ecclesiastical windows. Like the, the Bible. Ecclesiastes. All right. It stood on no lonely hill, but was wedged between Tyndall's Hardware Store and the Maycomb Tribune office. The jail was Maycomb's only conversation piece. Its detractor said it looked like a, a Victorian privy. Its supporters said it gave the town a good, solid, respectable look, and no stranger would ever suspect that it was full of niggers. As we walked up the sidewalk, we saw a solitary light burning in the distance. Well, that's funny, said Jim. Jill doesn't have an outside light. Looked like it's over the door, said Dill. A long extension cord ran between the bars of a second floor window and down the side of the building. In the light, from where its bare bulb, Atticus was sitting propped against the front door. He was sitting in one of his office chairs, and he was reading oblivious of the night bugs dancing over and around his head. I made to run, but Jim caught me. Don't, 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 don't go to him, he said. He might not like it. He's all right. Let's go home. I just wanted to see where he was. We were taking a shortcut across the square when, our, when four dusty cars came in from the Meridian Highway, moving slowly in a long line. They went around the square, past the bank building, and stopped in front of the jail. Nobody got out. We saw Atticus look up from his newspaper. He closed it, folded it deliberately, dropped it in his lap, and pushed his hat to the back of his head. He seemed to be expecting them. Come on, whispered Jim. We streaked across the square, across the street, until we were in the shelter of the Jitney Jungle Store. Jim peeked up the sidewalk. We can get closer, he said. We ran to Tyndall's hardware store. Near enough, at the same time, discreet. In ones and twos, men got out of the cars. Shadows became substance as light revealed solid shapes moving toward the jail door. Atticus remained where he was. The men hid him from view. He in there, Mr. Finch? A man said, he is, we heard Atticus answer, and he's asleep. Don't wake him up. In obedience to my father, there followed what I later realized was a sickeningly comic aspect of an unfunny situation. The men talked in near whispers. You know what we want, another man said. Get aside from the door, Mr. Finch. You can turn around and go home again, Walter, Atticus said pleasantly. Heck, Tate's around somewhere. The hell he is, said another man. Hex, Hex bunches so deep in the woods, they won't get out till morning. Indeed, why so? Called him off on a snipe hunt, was the succinct answer. Didn't uh, you think of that, Mr. Finch? <laughs> Thought about it, but didn't believe it. Well then. My father's voice was still the same. That changes things a bit, doesn't it? It do, another deep voice said. Its owner was a shadow. Do you really think so? Now this was the time I heard Atticus ask that question in two days, and it meant somebody's man would get jumped. This was too good to miss. I broke away from Jim and ran as fast as I could to Atticus. Jim shrieked and tried to catch me, but I had a lead on him and Dill. I pushed my way through the dark, smelly bodies and burst into the circle of light. <laughs> hey, Atticus! I thought he would have had a fine surprise, but his face killed my joy. A flash of plain fear was going out of his eyes, but returned when Dill and Jim wriggled into the light along with me. There was a uh, smell of stale whiskey and, uh, and pig pen about. And when I glanced around, I discovered that these men were all strangers. They were not the people I saw last night. Hot embarrassment shot through me. I had leaped triumphantly into a ring of people I had never seen before. 
Atticus got up from his chair, but he was moving slowly like an old man. He put the newspaper down very carefully, adjusting its creases with lingering fingers. They were trembling a little. Go home, Jim, he said. Take Scout and Dill home. We were accustomed to prompt, if not always cheerful, acquiescence to Atticus's instructions, but from the way he stood, Jim was not thinking of budging. Go home, I said. Jim shook his head. At Atticus's fist went to his hips, so did Jim's. And as they faced each other, I could see little resemblance between them. Jim's soft brown hair and eyes, his oval face and snug fitting ears, were our mother's, contrasting oddly with Atticus's gray and black hair and square cut features. But they were uh, somehow alike. Mutual defiance made them alike. Son, I said, go home. Jim shook his head. I'll send him home, a burly man said and grabbed Jim roughly by the collar. He yanked Jim nearly off his feet. Don't you touch him! I kicked the man swiftly. Barefooted, I was surprised to see him fall back in real pain. I intended to kick his shin, but aimed too high. <laughs> That'll do, Scout. Atticus put his hand on my shoulder. Don't kick, folks. No, he said as I was pleading justification. Ain't nobody gonna do Jim that way, I said. All right, Mr. Finch, get him out of here. Someone growled. You got 15 seconds to get him out of here. In the midst of this strange assembly, Atticus stood trying to make Jim mind him. I ain't going, was the steady answer to Atticus's threats, requests, and finally, please, Jim, take them home. I was getting a bit tired of that, but felt Jim had his own reasons for doing what he did. In view of his prospects, once Atticus did get him home, I looked around the crowd. It was a summer's night, but the men were dressed, most of them, in overalls and, and, and dim, denim shirts, buttoned up to the collars. I thought they must be cold-natured, as their sleeves were unrolled and buttoned down at the cuffs. Some wore hats, pulled firmly down over the ears. They were sullen-looking. Sleepy-eyed men who seemed unused to late hours. I saw him once more for a familiar face, and in the center of the semicircle, I found one. Hey, Mr. Cunningham! The man did not hear me, it seemed. Hey, Mr. Cunningham, how's your uh, entailment getting along? Mr. Walter Cunningham's legal affairs were well known to me. Atticus had once described them at length. The big man blinked and hooked his thumbs in his overall straps. He seemed uh, 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 uncomfortable. He cleared his throat and looked away. My friendly overture had fallen flat. Mr. Cunningham wore no hat, and the top half of his forehead was white in contrast to his sun-scorched face, which led me to believe that he wore one most days. He shifted his feet, clad in heavy work shoes. Don't you remember me, Mr. Cunningham? I'm Jean Louise Finch. You uh, brought us some hickory nuts one time, remember? I began to sense the utility one feels when unacknowledged by a chance acquaintance. I go to school with Walter, I began again. He's your boy, ain't he? Ain't he? Ain't he, sir? Mr. Cunningham was uh, moved to a faint nod. He didn't know me, after all. He's in my grade. I said, and he does right well. He's a good boy, I added. A real nice boy. We brought him home for dinner one time. Maybe he told you about me. I beat him up one time, but uh, he was real nice about it. Tell him hey for me, won't you? Atticus had said it was the polite thing to talk to people about what they were interested in, but not about what you were interested in. Mr. Cunningham displayed no interest in his son, so I tackled his entailment once more, in a last-ditch effort to make him feel at home. Entailments are bad, I was advising him, when I slowly awoke to the fact that I was addressing the entire aggregation. The men were all looking at me now, and some of them had their mouths agape, wide open. 
Atticus had stopped poking at Jim. They were standing together beside Bill. Their attention uh, amounted to fascination. Atticus's mouth even was uh, half open, an attitude he had once described as uncouth. Our eyes bent, and he shut it. <clears throat> well, Atticus, I would just say to Mr. Cunningham that enthrallments are bad and all that, but uh, you said not to worry to make a long time sometime, but you all would write it all out together. I was slowly drying up, wondering what idiocy I had committed. Entailments seemed all right enough for living room talk. I began to feel sweat gathering at the edges of my hair. I could stand anything but a bunch of people just staring at me. Uh, they were all quite still. What's the matter? I asked. Atticus said nothing. I looked around and up at Mr. Cunningham, whose face was equally impassive. Then he did a peculiar thing. He squatted down and took me by both shoulders. I'll tell him you said hey, little lady, he said. Then he straightened up and waved a big paw. Let's clear out, he called. Let's get going, boys. As they had come in ones and twos, the men shuffled back to the ramshackle cars. Doors slammed, engines coughed, and they were gone. I turned to Atticus, but Atticus had gone to the jail and was leaning against it with his face to the wall. I went to him and pulled his sleeve. Can we go home now? He nodded, produced his handkerchief, gave his face a going over, and blew his nose violently. Mr. Finch? A soft, husky voice came from the darkness above. They gone? Atticus stepped back and looked up. They've gone, he said. Get some sleep, Tom. They won't bother you no more. From a different direction, another voice cut crisply through the night. You damn tootin' they won't. Had you covered all the time, Atticus? Mr. Underwood and a double-barreled shotgun were leaning out his window above the Maycomb Tribune office. It was long past my bedtime, and I was growing, growing quite tired. It seemed that Atticus and Mr. Underwood would talk for the rest of the night. Mr. Underwood out the window, and Atticus up at him. Finally, Atticus returned, switched off the light above the jail door, and picked up his chair. Can I carry it for you, Mr. Finch? asked Dill. He had not said a word the whole time. Well, thank you, son. Walking toward the office, Dill and I fell into step behind Atticus and Jim. Dill was encumbered by the chair, and his pace was slower. Atticus and Jim were well ahead of us, and I assumed that Atticus was giving him hell for not going home, but I was wrong. As they passed under a streetlight, Atticus reached out and massaged Jim's hair, his one gesture of affection to his son. The end.